All right. Well, let's get this uh, started. So, hello, everybody. We are back after a short hiatus of about, what is it, like a year or something? The last podcast was uh, 2022 in review, and that was February of 2022. Uh, I had a kid, and we had a chug workshop that we set up. And so that's our excuse. <laughs> to not show up more often. Um, but we're back today. Uh, I My name is David Leclerc. I am a host of this uh, Chalk Podcast. I'm here with uh, uh, Pat Sims. Hello. Then uh, Ryan Duggan. Hello. And Daniel Vassell. How's it going? Daniel, I, I keep mispronouncing your name, I'm pretty sure. Vassell, or is that? Spot on. It's French. Oh, spot on. Oh, wow. My my mo has been oh. mispronouncing everybody's name, so I'm pretty happy this is this turns out pretty good. Um, French, but not French Canadian, so they'll still so, probably mess it up. Exactly. Um, today's podcast is about flow imaging. So there's a bunch of news that came out over uh, the last year or so. A bunch of new instruments. Uh, being developed that provides us with uh, imaging capacity with our flow stamters. And uh, we're going to discuss what those are and how we should use them. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, bring a couple of things. Um, first off, uh, Pat used to be a manager of the core facility at Loyola and is now retired. So what, how do we call you now? Like. <laughs> I, I, I think Pat will do. Pat will do, but but you yeah. must have a title like a, like a, this is like oh a yeah, career, yeah. like a call her, uh, yeah we can call her uh, director emeritus. Okay, nice. Yes, thank you, thank we'll you. Do that. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to to point out that I saw a, a tweet. No, it's on LinkedIn. I saw that from uh, uh, J. Paul Robinson. Uh, who's promoting a new textbook that came out called Flow Storm Tree Today. It was uh, written by somebody called Claudio Ortolani, Italian guy. It's an Italian group that made a uh, um, kind of a an update of, uh, I don't, I don't want to say Shapiro's uh, uh, practical flow, but like it's, it's basically going through the details of how Flow Storm Tree works and they kind of go into... A lot of details, kind of quickly over a lot of uh, uh, information, uh, the newest detectors, the newest uh, type of instruments that we have. I've been looking for these type of documents for a while now. So I think it's a, it's a nice tool that, that we have. Um, and I wanted to point out that Ryan is actually cited twice in there. Your, your blog post about really the, uh, the uh, Galios yeah. and the Guava instrument. Nice. Like nice. that's mentioned twice. It's kind of interesting that wow. you can write blog posts and that goes into pretty yeah. nice paper. So yeah. Little did I know that I, I basically just made up everything that I wrote and then, you know, maybe a month later changed my mind yeah. and then loved the Galios and then hated it again. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, it can be a daily thing, can't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But man, that the book is uh, pretty pricey. I'm looking at something that says a paperback is $143.99. Yeah, they don't give those away. It's nice to be part yeah. of an institution that has, a, like, I, I can just download the PDF of the thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, how much was it on Pirate Bay? <laughs> <laughs> okay to today's topic uh <clears throat> flow imaging um so there's a bunch of instruments that came out over the years uh that provides uh, imaging capacity with our flow stamp tree instruments and and uh more recently bd came out with uh, their their new brand flagship flow uh, cell sorter uh, that provides us with the ability to to look at images of the cells we're going to be uh, sorting, and 
I so we're at Chug are consumers of Flow Stamp Tree products and we go with the information that is available or, or not available in most cases. Uh, and 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 it's kind of hard to figure out a how does all of this work and and b uh, why do I want one of these? Uh, and and I think it's particularly true with with um, with imaging. Um, if you look at like a, the history of flow imaging uh, systems, uh, they're around. They're kind of pretty amazing the way they work, but. Uh, I, I've yet to see that much usage out of any of them. So I'm kind of surprised to see now uh, a bunch of manufacturers proposing all these tools as if it's something that they, they're pretty certain will, will actually um, find a niche and, and be super useful. So I don't know what your, your position is uh, on, on that, that, uh, that aspect of with the proposal, say. Uh, that were, were presented. Yeah, I, well, I think like, first off, I think we've hit peak psychometer is probably the main reason. Like you can't really make your latest flow psychometer that much more unique or better. I mean, every psychometer out there that comes out new is a thousand times better than anything we've ever had in the history of cytometry. Um, <laughs> and so how are you going to differentiate your product? I mean, you need to put in some kind of bell and or whistle in order to stand out from your competitor. So I think, yeah, I mean, the acoustic thing, the uh, spectral deconvolution thing, all, all, all things that help differentiate. So I really think it's like, you know, sitting in the boardroom trying to come up with ideas. Uh, how are we going to get the attention back on our platform? Oh, let's throw in some imaging, but let's not use cameras, <laughs> which sounds really crazy. Like, can you call it imaging still if you're if you're not using cameras? But uh, yeah, I mean, the but the thing that kind of um, irks me a little bit about all of these cytometry imaging platforms is that anybody who does um, actual imaging, like serious imaging, laughs at what we call an imaging cytometer. I mean, I think the, the quality, the resolution, um, you know, it's, it's basically like going back to the days when you had a two megapixel camera on your flip phone, you know, trying to show other people um, the Grand Canyon, the shot of the Grand Canyon that you took on your tiny little two inch LCD screen compared to, you know, throwing up your, your iPhone camera images on a, on a big screen in your living room. I mean, it's a totally different thing. So um, yeah, I mean, I would just say just to kind of start the conversation you know, I think the rationale for putting it in there is, I don't know, maybe this might be unpopular, but I'd say mostly marketing. Um, and then, you know, enough of a hook to get people to generate some excitement. Around it. But I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong. Yeah. Well, I would be very surprised if this was in response to, uh, you know, facilities saying we have a crying need for this and that's why they developed it. <clears throat> it's kind of a shame that we don't have more of that dialogue that we can kind of tell them where we're having problems. The, I, I, the companies used to be much more, you know, amenable to listening to what your problems were. I, I worked with BD years ago. It was like software, but they had us evaluate it and then they came back and they changed things after we evaluated. So at least they cared at that point, how, we, what, how it was for the people who were using it. And it just seems kind of like you're saying the marketing is driving the business as opposed to what the users need. Well, from my understanding, cores aren't the major purchasers anymore. You know, and I think that's why sort of our feedback may not be as valuable anymore. We're not the major purchasers of these equipment. Main purchasers would be who then just like, private labs it seems, uh, industry yeah it's a lot more private labs that they're getting cheaper 
we see mm -hmm. a lot more of that going on um or you know occasionally we'll have companies call us and be like you know hey we'll be there for that demo next week it's like that, that's not us that's a <laughs> that's a lab you know we all the time we got more labs that are trying to get cytometers um you know either on their own um yeah it seems like things are moving away from course at least in our perspective, at least when I've talked to a lot of the field application scientists, where you're spending most of your time, you know, it's individual little labs or, you know, places like Charles River that that specialize in one thing. Yeah. I so invited Daniel because I think he has good ideas about how to use the instrument, these these imaging uh, capabilities, not to put you on the spot. But um... well, so I was thinking. As I was gonna say, I was thinking about this too, because you know Ryan sent out stuff in our, our little email chat beforehand on well, what else is out there, the cell insight, and I love it because that's where I kind of came from, you know, with my, with my research way back when was doing a lot of live cell imaging. I'm just looking at these things and being like, man, if I had this back in the day, that would have been awesome. And you know, it's imaging is getting faster, and that's why I think that they took flow, which was fast, and are trying to add imaging because they're worried that eventually at some point. You know, we would think of it as, you know, plate readers or spinning disc and focal microscopy and these things are going to catch up. Right. And as I was, you know, explaining, uh, explaining to my wife, who also was a lot about imaging and flow, mainly just because I talk about it. <laughs> I was like, man, you got to see what these new things are and what they can do. And she's like, well, why would people do flow then? That's one of those like, oh, yeah, think for a second. And. Michigan State's in a unique position because about 10% of our users are doing immunology. We do not have an imagology department. We get all these kind of crazy things in all the time, which you talk about imaging sorting. It's like, well, I got about three or four users I know that would want to sort based off of images. Um, but beyond like immunology, where you're trying to find, you know, a 1% population, a lot of my users are just... They take a 24 well, they have to subculture it, prep it into a single cell suspension, and then they're running to look at one or two colors, often for a CRISPR screening for, did this work? Do I have green in there or not? A lot of times it's like, if they could just take a 24 well, pop it onto something, even a 96 well, and just be able to look at those images and get the data right away, that would save them so much, so much time, considering right. the cell prep that takes for flow. Yeah, can you, can you maybe walk us through an example? Because I mean, I, I can understand all of those use cases, but I'm still like, yeah, I could do that on a regular ARIA or something like that. So where is the key feature of like either bright field or fluorescence localization or something that you need to actually sort based off of that specific metric? So two main projects come to mind. One that's this incredible, really interesting and we've been struggling with um, is a PI in Michigan State um, named Nina Whale, and she works with endospores. And if you're not familiar with endospores, you know, it's bacteria that are like spores. When they're in that spore-like state, they're darn near indestructible. They can survive temperature, pressure, and everything else. So you have to find a host. In their case, they're using water fleas to get these things to germinate and grow and then try to study. But you can't study them because anything that we want to do in flow, you're like, well, what do you want to look at? What fluorophores do we want to add on there? Well, all they have is endospore state, which is indestructible outer shell that you can't attach fluorophores to. You can't die. You can't do anything to it. Or they're in these various gestation states that look anything from like little grapes to cauliflower to mustaches. <laughs> um, all these kinds of weird shapes are in these life cycle. And if you look at papers on the life cycle, it's like, well, this one we think is anywhere between 30 minutes to three days post-infection. And this one is somewhere along these lines. So they can't even study them because they can't even get the ones that are open and growing that you could actually transfect to study anything. So they came to us with this problem with, can you, can you sort these out? Can we try to sort out some of the ones that are alive, open, that aren't contained within the endospores. And that's what we've been working on, is trying to identify unique autofluorescent properties and a combination of like sizes and shapes on our on our influx here, where we can then sort out enough of those cells that they can transfect, they can study them, they can try to start figuring out what's going on. So that's one. There's another group that's trying to knock out different genes in cholera, um, Chris Waters at MSU, and they're looking at how that changes the curvature of cholera. And so that's another one where we're trying to look at differences in, 
you know, like fitzy area versus width versus height to try to see if we could pull out the shapes that way to then sort out which ones in their giant screening library actually affected the curve and the shape. And both of those are, if we just had a bright field camera on a sorter, they wouldn't need me at all. Yeah. And how much, um, yeah, no, super interesting. I, I wonder like, you know, I would say, can some of that or much of that be correlated to scatter? Um, maybe in addition to just forward scatter and side scatter, other angles of scatter, can you, can you maybe reconstruct some of those um, size and shape and whatnot metrics to just scattered light or do you need images? We haven't been able to just do it on scattered light so far for a variety of reasons, those that you can think of and new challenges that creep up all the time. So from what so I'm it's... hearing, applications where we don't have actual floor fours are the ones that are going to be more interesting for these imaging cytometers. Like if you don't have anything to attach to your cells, might as well look at it take a picture, take tons of pictures and, and see what you can do. Well, I think like the, the autofluorescence is interesting. If there's modifications in autofluorescence signatures and, you know, showing that on a um, spectral type sorting instrument might be useful for some of those applications. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, it sounds, um, relatively niche at at first hearing but i'm sure there's lots of places that do that kind of stuff you know i'm i'm surrounded by immunologists and cell biologists for the most part so like those types of applications never come across my core I, facility so i kind of feel the same i'm i'm, I'm at the point where i'm a crossroad right uh, I remember when I first saw Sony's uh, very first spectral flow cytometer, I forget the name, like the RS2486299H. <laughs> You're just making that up. No, exactly. no, I, I, I think that was it. <laughs> like a couple of digits off, but I, I think I'm right. Um, I saw a presentation at Cyto. A guy was looking at some variation, like at aging of GFP or something like that. I couldn't figure out what the point of spectral flow was at like what, just based on that that specific instrument. We tried to uh, get this uh, Sony to demo the instrument in our lab. They wouldn't do it. So like it took forever for me to figure out um, what spectral would do. So I kind of feel the same way about imaging flow, where I have no clue why I would use it, but there might be some something will be revealed. In, in due time, if uh, if I'm patient. Enough. Okay, then. So let me uh, let me continue on my devil's advocate route here. All right, let's go. How, how long have you had an image stream in your lab? Oh, you bought it in 2009, I believe. <laughs> yeah. or, or earlier, who knows? But and and how much? How many use cases do you have on a regular basis for that instrument? No, yeah, the 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 uh, image stream is the instrument you constantly need to promote. You'll get a few projects started, and then the project ends, and then usage goes back down, and you kind of always repeat. It's not something people come back to. So, yeah, that's the. Uh, so do you think it's the? Do you think it's the the addition of sorting capabilities that is the differentiator? No, I think. Image stream was the analysis was always complicated. Uh, probably put off a bunch of people. I'm kind of curious to see if the Amnis uh, machine learning software will help with any of that. Where basically you kind of feed the software a bunch of images of the different groups you want to identify. And it's basically that the software cluster them out and, and provide you the, the best feature to. Uh, measures the, oh. those differences. But... Wouldn't you have to have that if you were going to do uh, sorting with imaging? You would have to 
visually sort out two populations and let them figure out some kind of a numeric values for different parameters in order to sort them out, right? So it's still going to have to be complicated. Yeah. Uh, I think that's on the, if we, we can discuss image, like let's get back to the image stream uh, and what's, okay. what's in the future uh, in a bit. But yeah, I think that's probably some something that a hurdle that that's in a way. Um, do, so I thought we'd go over the history of imaging systems. Uh, if that's okay with you guys. And basically yeah. geek out about the details of how they work. Uh, and then move on from there. I uh, want to start with the, 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 the attuned site picks is one that I've been Ask if I want if I was interested in uh, replacing our current Attune NXT by the Attune side picks. I know Danielle, do you have one? Uh, we do. What can you tell me about it? It's much better than the cytometer we replaced, which, which was... was a LSR one oh, that was upgraded right. to an LSR two in the field. <laughs> and when it turned twenty one, I ran a little ethanol through it. Um, that's so there, there's been a lot of advancements in 21 years but uh i i love it so far um but the imaging capacity i think that the way that the attune site fix incorporates imaging is the way that it should be done because it's an afterthought you don't attract anybody to the cytometer saying like we have imaging Right, because like you said everybody with imaging is no. Oh, I'm going to a confocal if I want to look at pictures, but instead it's just it's one extra little feature. If you know, like if you're turning it on, you're, you're like, well, you're looking at your Fitzy area plot, but why don't you also just put one for height on there, see if it looks any better. That's how we kind of use the imaging so far, and that has been very helpful. People don't export the images, but they use it as another troubleshooting tool. Um. In my experience, most people, when they turn on the images, they go, oh, I didn't realize myself looked like that. I don't want images. <laughs> um, it's the, been a great training are... tool. Come again? So, sorry? No, go ahead. I say it's been, an, it's been a good training tool for that. Because um, everybody has problem users in a core, right? Where it's, you know, like, I, I'll give you $100 if you can prove to me that there's a single cell in your sample. <laughs> Um, well, this is great because now I have a camera to show them that I think we need to go back to sample prep. Um, that part is really nice. Or they look on there, the number of users that have never looked at their cells in a microscope before. And then they have that picture where the whole thing is just blebbing out and they go, I should probably go back to sample prep is, is really useful and helpful. It's been great though. In other cases where you end up with a little artifact on your plot and it's like, oh, that's just, is it, you know, debris or an antibody aggregate? Well, it's great when you can throw the camera over there and go, nope, those are cells. Huh, we have a little autofluorescent population we never expected before. Or, yep, those are cells that have, you know, these giant little aggregates on the side of them that I want to completely ignore. So can for we, that, it's great. Can we geek out, geek out a bit about the details on how the machine, how the images are taken, uh, what the data looks like? Um, is the camera a CCD or I haven't read much about the side picks actually. I'm not sure of hand. Um, um, putting it in spot. I'm sorry. No, I knew you would. So I had the manual pulled up. It's not a CCD. It's not. But that's not coming up in my search terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I imagine, I imagine though, <clears throat> like, it works on the attune partly because of the acoustic focusing. Oh yeah, right. So you don't have to like chase around cells in a core stream that are kind of floating around, right? Nope. It's just a turn on, turn off option. So people are already coming to use this instead of the LSR two. They love it because they can run really fast with the acoustic focusing. Now we have imaging as an extra tool. Um, the software is really poorly designed. Um, it, it if same, you're taking uh, more color scheme, if, orange and gray, the instrument or the software, the software, um, no, it's black and gray. Oh, okay. With over the background. 
But if I'm exporting like a thousand images, it can take 10 minutes for saving. And it's like, don't close the software. We're, we're still saving these images. And it's like, these are bright field images that are 20 kilobytes in size. This, this shouldn't take you a long time. Um, so that part's not great, but we just use it as a troubleshooting tool. They're supposed to have a software update that's going to do a lot more like the image stream where it does, you know, 26 different parameters and it'll tell you area and you can put those on the scatter plots too. But I got a feeling that it's, I'm going to be looking at people's data with that afterwards. And if I see something, I'll let them know. The, the, my understanding is that you, the, so the, you get the pictures and then the software automatically calculates a series of features about the images. So the uh, sphere, sphericity, that's not a word. Circularity. Circularity. <laughs> the, uh, that's, that's what the new software is supposed to do, but it has, hasn't been released yet. They won't show me the beta on it. The current software doesn't do anything. It just that's has okay. the pictures. Well, that's, that's, let's play this for the people who are watch this podcast in the future and the software has already been released. So, so the general <laughs> idea is that you, you'll have a series of measurements like the, uh, the, the, basically just the image, like the bright field itself. Uh, you'll have, I, presumably the size of the cells will be uh, provided. Area, you um, know, eccentricity, entropy, max intensity, minimum intensity, average intensity. Um, they've got all the 26 parameters up on their their website for it. But it's all the basic ones like you would get if you were using image J on a bright field yeah. image. I think you, you can, you get, I haven't played with, with the software, so stop me if I'm, I'm about, no, yeah, anyway. Uh, you All these v values are stored straight in the FCS files. And the only thing you cannot get out are the actual images where you, I guess you do a copy paste if you want to present those or whatever. I don't know. I don't know how the data is going to be stored. And that'll be interesting because it's a nightmare to get the images out right now either. You can only open it up on the Attune software. It's supposed to get integration with FCS Express, like the image stream, where they will be able to open up and view the images. Um, but even then, if I'm exporting the experiment, which contains the images, there's no way for me to figure out that image what any of the fcs data corresponds to it not even the image flag is in the fcs data oh there's no there's no link from outside of this the uh attune software there's no way to click on an event and say this is that cell and then yeah even if i know if it's picture number 1000 there's no way for me to figure out what event number corresponds to picture 1000 to make that correlation hmm okay so, so presumably that the the use here is like basically like what you guys do troubleshooting, uh, doublet discrimination, really kick ass doublet discrimination, uh, which was great because we had a PI that's been doing flow for twenty years that didn't believe in doublet discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're making slow converts. There have been some really interesting things though that we found. We um, had some isolation from mice where they're looking for kind of a new cell type or rarely explored one that they've been struggling to find. And we found it. It was in the, what was noise and debris. So I'm having a lot of fun looking at that where we always think of forward and side scatter is size and granularity and kind of forget the whole idea of refractive index and reflection. And it's like, wow, there are entire populations of cells that have such a different refractive index that they appear in spots we never considered. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the first YouTube uh, videos if you look up the attuned site fix forget who it was on but it was another researcher in accord that explained the same thing that we always thought these were doublets when we looked at them and found a whole new cell type that was just twice the size that we had been discriminating against so the imaging is useful but i don't think that anybody's coming to a cytometer to say like yeah i want imaging right right what's the price tag do you know on the uh the site fix module itself not for the addition. I think that that ours was in excess of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the full package, but we get the we get all the bells and whistles. Okay. And so ours was provided from a USDA um, NIFA grant, an equipment grant that we won. Yeah. You know, I I um 
I think I have a great use case Ooh. for that instrument. Um, is it, <clears throat> does it, can it do like um, absolute counts straight away without beads? Yep. Yeah. So like somehow counting cells from tissues is the most difficult task in the world uh, accurately, right? So no matter what kind of automated cell counter you put samples on, we get wildly different answers of how many live cells are actually in this sample. And I have switched solely to doing all cell counts by flow. Um, so right now our instrument of choice for that is the Quantion using a, you know, an AO PI type dual fluorescent setup to gate the live cell population. But on really nasty tissue samples, there's so much uh, gray area between nucleated and non-nucleated, as well as live and dead, that <clears throat> it would actually be quite nice to poke around on you know some of those dots and see, like even in just a bright field image of what do they look like? Do they look like cells? Does it look like debris? I've taken parallel samples that I've run on the quantity on the count and then thrown them on the image stream to kind of prove to myself that I was drawing the proper gate, um, which, you know, as you can imagine, setting up the image stream, um, running through the QC for like 45 minutes just to run a single sample to, you know, prove a gate is overkill. And you're not gonna do it all the time. But if you had all that at the ready, that would be kind of nice to just be able to say, hey, my cutoff of what's debris and what's a cell um, seems legit, you know, according to both the fluorescence data as well as some uh, bright field images. So, th you know, that that could be definitely a use case. I don't know if it's as strong of a use case to warrant the extra price tag, but, you know, if I got a grant, I'd take it. Well, that's the plug for cores again. We actually have somebody that that does that. They only run forward and side scatter because um, the site max boasts that it can run a 96 wall plate in 20 minutes. And so they can load it up with a whole bunch of my samples and take, you know, really quick red blood cell counts to figure out what they want to do, go from there. Yeah. Let's, let's check the, uh, let's move on to the next, the next platform, which uh, should be the BD Fax Discover S8, which is their new flagship cell sorter, which is uh, at the time of the recording not available anywhere. I think there's a, probably a couple of beta systems out there in the wild, but uh, none of us have actually seen it, I think, right? Well, Scott, Cor Scott Cortopassi was telling me that this is going to be something new because it's a break from the musical names that they have for their instruments. Yeah, now they're going to the Star Trek franchise. <laughs> uh, so so I've, I've read the paper that came out last year, year before, that explained how that imaging system works. Uh, but just so we kind of covered our bases, the Fax Discover is just this giant monster of like five laser, 70 something detectors, uh, does spectral, uh, and then has this imaging uh, capabilities. Uh, but as Ryan pointed out, it's not actually using cameras. It's now, uh, am I the one who's going to have to explain how this works? Or, or... <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Dang it. Well, I'll make fun of you afterwards. All right. So so I'm going to point out, we're, we're I get take, again, take consumers of flow, but not the experts in all things flow. So I'm going to get all this pretty much wrong. Uh, so you should double check with your uh, BD experts or whatever. Uh, but essentially, my understanding is you're going to split your laser beam before it hits the flow cell. Uh, and it's going to go through uh, what are called uh, acoustic. Uh, Acousto-optic modulator. Acoust yes, that. And 
it goes to two like each side of your split goes to one of these uh on one end uh as it goes through that acoustic <clears throat> it it basically breaks the beam in a bunch of different beamlets and gives them different frequency, different angles. And then the other one serves as a reference. I don't know what that means. But then at the end, we kind of bring this bundle, all these beamlets and the reference laser, and then go back to the flow cell, all of them together. Um, and so the pulse that you get from the different detectors as your, your signal hits them uh, contains that encoded information from all of these different beamlets. And then through this thing called Fourier transformation, you can actually transform the pulse into a pixel. And then because uh, your, your different beamlets have different frequency, that basically gives them a the position of the pixel on a y-axis and time becomes the x-axis so so that's how you generate the image overall that's roughly what i understood not bad not bad all right the uh, video guy i heard talk about it told me that it was you're taking light and you're turning it into sound and then the receiver on the other end is an AM, fm transmitter so you turn to one station and it goes my brightness is three and the next one my brightness is five and then you write all of those down as you're making a grid over time. And then it's like my son's paint by number. Yeah. And the picture comes out. Yeah. So um, the, the, the nice thing about this system, my understanding is that it allows us to keep the same speed of the, the same event rate uh, very, very quick. And so we don't like, we're not, you know, the, the signals are, are basically, uh, quickly processed so so the sorting decision remains really really fast um i i and and presumably we get the same type of measurements that we've had with the side picks like the the circularity the blah 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 blah, blah and and use those i guess to to set gates uh all of that by the way the imaging happens on one single laser uh, the blue one, uh, and not on the other laser beams. I think there's a cost issue here, just like making that happen on, on every single laser beam is just prohibitive. And so that's why we're, we're not, it's not, it's not available at this point. The question that I still have is whether or not the paper I've read had three, like it, it was a really simple flow stamper, like a, a uh, three laser, eight detector, something like that. And, and you had your fit CP, AP, uh, per CPS 5.5, PSI 7. So all four of them had uh, this, this ability to take pictures. Uh, now with the Discover S8, I don't know. It's a spectral instrument. So I don't know if every single detector is of the blue uh, laser are capable of making these pictures or what happens with your spectral images. Like I, I don't quite understand that specific part. But there you go. We can now sort based on images. Do you have any idea of why you would want to do that? What's the, uh, what kind of like, I don't know, can you talk about resolution with these images? Mm, um, like <clears throat> how, I just how much, like how much like granularity like are you going to be able to get? Pictures. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's that's what I was assuming from what you know you can see on the website that it looks like kind of what you get off an image stream but um but yeah so i mean that the um, presumably you're sorting live cells i mean i guess you could sort fixed and perm cells if you wanted and yeah, me, yeah. I, I'm just trying to like all of this, the reasons why I want to use imaging are typically like nuclear translocation or you know other kind of intracellular organelle staining and whatnot. And some are super vital, but many are not. Um, but I would like to sort 
a live cell to do something downstream based off of a signaling event. And can you actually do that is the question. I'm, I'm just, this is actually just, you know, coming out of my brain right now. <laughs> I haven't thought about this at all, but uh, yeah, I mean, the stuff that I like to do on the image stream is all intracellular staining based, but sorting seems like it's made for live cells. Are those two things compatible or not? Or are we just like the site picks, you know, confirming debris and dead cells or doublets and stuff like that? I feel like you wouldn't need the whole, because now we can actually look at the markers from the fluorescent detectors of the blue laser. You can pair them on the, I'm going to call it the bright field image, but like basically the, uh, the uh, I, I don't actually know if there's a bright field image. Probably not. Yeah, they use, um, I, it's, it basically seems yeah, like they're too. looking like absorption or like mm, light yeah, loss yeah. as a way of um, creating a pseudo bright field image. Yeah, the light loss images. Well, I guess so, before yeah. thinking about that, like what the BD Discover is going to do, just imagine if you could sort with the amnes, with the image stream. Like, would you want to? I think that's where I struggle is if that one was it had the ability to sort, do I need it? Every application that that comes to my mind is all I need is bright field. And I know that there are microfluidic sorters that are introducing bright field imaging for that very reason. It's slower, but I mean, it would certainly work and it's certainly a lot cheaper than what I imagine the discovery is going to be. BD talks about like promotes the, a couple of applications. I think fish was one of them, but then I don't know much about fish so i don't know but even like with fish or phlegm or frep or you know bipsy or any of those most of them you can already get around with flow i mean you can look at fret with flow as it is and i can sort with that without images so if you're i think images it's just like ryan said i'm thinking intercellular structure so where is that useful or in impactful for anything there's a few like drug discovery applications i could see given that it's hard to figure out where your drug, you know, goes, or maybe you want to be able to isolate it within a specific cell type, or you want to do genomics later on with something in particular, and you really need to not only have this specific cell type that expresses that marker, but that that marker is localized to this region. But it'd have to be like a cell surface or internal expression, because it's, I mean, do you believe co-localization images on the image stream? Like, I believe FRET, but without that Z resolution, it's it's really iffy. Mm. Yeah, stuff like I, I think we're back to uh, if you don't have any markers to look at your cells, that's when it's going to be useful. But then, the question is: Is the quality of the image good enough for for you to make anything out of it? And because the image that they present is obviously the, the best one they ever got, but like even there, it's it's. I mean, it's fascinating technique and technology, but maybe that's what'll be the thing is that this is their pilot technology because they already know it's going to be easier to scale this into whatever the the next thing or the future is going to be. Um, that or somebody that's watching this podcast after it's recorded could be like, how did you not think of this application? That's the future. Yeah, yeah. And we're all just showing off our own ignorance, but I don't know. That's, that's why I enjoy this and just talking to other people in the community. Cause somebody has got a project or working with something that you've never thought of. And that always spurs on another idea and uh, something else. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> yeah. Like, I mean, at, um, when I was at university of Chicago, we did, uh, an application on the image stream, uh, basically an internalization um, application. And it was internalization like of a antibody drug conjugate 
um, co-localization to a lysosome. So all of that can be done uh, super vitally. And so you could say, I want to sort out cells that, you know, are just at the earliest stages of internalization, or I want to sort out cells that where the payload has co-localized to the lysosome or a late endosome or something like that. And that's all. So, so all that can be done by um, fluorescence molecules that are pH dependent like Frodo or um, other lysotracker dyes and whatnot. Um, so you, you, you can, and, and we have, um, again, for that specific project many years ago, looked at an image stream and then tried to replicate it on a sorter and looking at kind of what the fluorescence signatures look like on the image stream, we tried to gate the same population on a sorter but you know, having the images on the sorter would have been great. But I, I really like that is kind of as close as I can get to a real application that you know I I absolutely want to have images to make that sort successful. So we have a project similar that we're actually working on designing right now, where a researcher wants to do that. They want to sort microbes that have entered into lysosomes, only cells where that has happened, and. I don't know how much I can give away, but we basically did a lysa tracker, but did fret. So then paired the bacteria to express a protein that will fret with the lysa tracker dyes. And so that's how we know that they're there and they're in the right location. So it seems like there's there's always kind of another solution, everything that I can keep thinking of for it. I want to be a proponent because I love images and I love flow, but it's no, yeah, it's none of the uh, out of well, especially with how fast now, like all these sites. You know, if, when I go to my new users, I'm like, well, how many events do you run a core? And they go 10,000, and I go, why? You know, and then it's mm, I'm not sure. And you go through statistics, and you know, at what point does the population no longer change? And a lot of cases, it's like 2,000 cells, and I rarely see much deviation past that. Well, the cell insight can take a picture of 2,000 cells a whole lot quicker if you want to get that same information and data. So just, again, the imaging and flow, I fluorescent imaging and flow, it's, yeah, I just struggle to think of the applications. Yeah. Well, the the last segment of this discussion, I wanted to discuss, uh, like, the, 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 the very, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three, four weeks ago, uh, at this time of this recording, uh, SciTech announced that it purchased the uh, the same group of flow stampers that's been moving around from one company to the next. Uh, so it's basically the Amnis, the uh, flow site, the Guava, the Muse, and the Cell Stream. Um, so those were purchased initially by it was all Millipore Systems, then Luminex purchased them. And Luminex was bought out entirely by a group called Diasorin. And then Diasorin sold the flow sound tree component to Cytec. Um, so that was very exciting news. And now that I think of it, like I, I, it's it's very two, like Amnis and Cytec are two groups that I absolutely love. I, I, I'm not sure what to do. Like if, if you were in, in high up at, at SciTech, what would you do with the uh, these these platforms? Like Ryan, you, you wrote the thing about the guava and it was not a flattering <laughs> review. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, to me, this basically signals that, you know, SciTech is uh, pretty flush with cash and needed to do something with it, uh, invested in some way. And, you know, this was kind of the only affordable path to that, that, that made sense. Um, buying like, you know, a group of instruments like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I keep, I think like the, uh, I don't know. It just, like you said, it, they're kind of like the misfit cytometers of, 
a flow cytometry. They just kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, are all are always yeah. just you know, passed around from company to company, <clears throat> and and probably for a reason, right? I mean, the people who were really interested into image stream bought it 15 years ago um there's absolutely no development hardware wise on that instrument since i mean the mark ii was the last update and that's that's got to be 10 at least 10 years old have, at this point they have better cameras now i think to optimize for evs and stuff like that yeah 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 but I mean, like, you know, it's still painfully slow. Um, the software is, um, yeah, still pretty rudimentary. Even like the interesting kind of machine learning backed analysis um, of their new analysis software. Sounds great. I mean, I, I really feel like if it doesn't in the end, operate like google photos then it's kind of useless right i mean google photos can i can type any kind of little keyword into my photos and it'll pull up images of exactly what i was thinking of um it'll group cluster all of my images by um you know faces and names and all that kind of stuff and places and all that information but it's super easy to use that, you know, anybody on their smartphone can just kind of fiddle around with it and get the data that they're looking for. If it, if it doesn't end up like that, like so stupidly simple that anybody could just kind of throw some images at it and get some answers, then I think it's, you know, continued to, you know, destined to still be that really expensive instrument that kind of just sits around in your lab. Um, and gets very occasional use. So on the other hand, I think SciTech has just throughout its whole history been very innovative and taken taken things and actually kind of made them more practical. And I, I my hope would be that, because I think the SciTech could possibly really mesh with the image stream if they have somebody smart enough to figure out how to do that. Um. I haven't figured out, but you know, I think that they have a history of that, so that we might it might not be as uh, weird to move the little orphan uh, flow cytometers as it might seem with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see like the image stream benefiting from spectral and mixing, yeah, and a better plate loader and faster fluidics. Right, I'm all for that. Let's make a better image stream. But what I what I'm, you know, a little bit more skeptical with is slapping on imaging to an Aurora. Um, that, I mean, we've, we've, we've highlighted the killer use case of, you know, confirming debris and doublets, uh, a la the site picks. But, you know, beyond that, there doesn't seem to be a ton of value of taking a, a, a good cytometer that we all use and really like to use and just throwing on some, some imaging capabilities just as another set of uh, bell and whistle. Well, one of the fluorescent imaging and possibly sorting capabilities we never didn't discuss is EVs. I mean, that's one of the things that they say the instrument is good for, right? It's looking at those EVs, especially with the, the really sensitive detectors that are on the image stream and i highly suspect that SciTech is trying to make a better cytometer for ev detection um that is such a growing field and i constantly have new researchers that want to do that but the more stuff that i've gotten to into evs it's always like is this real or not or is it just the noise and debris and having the images especially when sorting evs would be great at having that extra confidence interval um, you throw spectral on top of that, then you're really able to separate out what is potentially noise or background signal. And the integration of the objectives is critical when you're going to start looking at things that are even smaller. So I could see a lot of the technology that's in the AMNIS being combined with, you know, 
SciTech and how great they are at engineering to to really making a an excellent cytometer designed for EVs. And there really isn't anything out there right now for that, um, except for the influx. But that's super old. <laughs> Isn't there another platform for EVs, like a small particle flow stamper? I forget the name. But for sorting? Oh, uh, not for yeah, sorting, not yeah. For sorting. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what I do. I've got researchers that are like, well, I need 100 million EVs sorted out so that we can yeah. start doing this to prove for therapeutics. And there's there's nothing for that. And if you want to sort out EVs, which a lot of the, the journals are coming back to saying, like, you need to prove that what you're saying is an EV is actually an EV or some kind of a purified population, there's a need for that of the market. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the kind of state of the art now for enriching EVs is bead-based methods that capture a bunch of EVs, right? So you don't do single EV analysis or enrichment. You get groups of them that you can then uh, do downstream applications with. So yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think that, that could be... Um, a really useful uh, use case for um, image-based sorting because, right? I mean, I think I don't. I mean, I, I guess uh, you know, could there be a PMT or APD-based sorter that is sensitive enough to give you single EV resolution uh, um, minus the imaging? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I've tried it a bunch of times. Um, I've sorted them, but like you said, in the end, I don't know exactly what I sorted. Um, I sorted a bunch of events. They had fluorescent <laughs> characteristics of things approximately of what I would say are EVs, but were they single EVs? Were they, you know, groups of EVs that were just kind of all sorted together? Um, it seems like the imaging angle for EVs, you know, has been demonstrated enough now that that it's kind of a necessity to um, ensure you're actually sorting what you think you're sorting. Let's play project manager and and imagine how would you get the image stream to sort cells, knowing what we know and. We're quite aware of the vast amount of stuff we don't actually know about sorting in general. And then, uh, but uh, the image stream is a very slow instrument. The, 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 the cells move fairly slowly in there. I think that should be something that's a good thing if you're going to try to sort EVs. I give more time to like get decent pictures out of it. Yeah, yeah, but I guess, you know, what, what the mechanism of sorting, right? So it's right. either mechanical, a la the Taito, or yeah. it's microfluidic, a la whoever, or it's electrostatic, like our traditional sorters. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it seems like electrostatic is kind of out for a super slow flow machine, unless you want, you know, giant baseball sized droplets coming out of the instrument. That's what you need so I mean, I guess. You need a guava <laughs> uh, capillary system. Oh no, don't even say it. I hate why capillaries. Would they, why would they have to be large if you put, if you did like a cuvette based region where you did the image analysis like it is, and then you had it lead to, you Speed know, electrostatic stored or after. Not even if it's you know, like speeding up. I mean, it could still be slow. I mean, to get a, a frequency, uh, applying an amp amplitude and frequency to such a slow stream. Like if you turn down your your sorter now to like, I don't know, on the Ari, I think we did, um, like tried to get down to like 6 PSI or something like that. The, the droplets were almost one droplet was almost a full, you know, droplet window screen. That person, you could probably get two droplets in that window. Um, but you I can get that just, slow if you get bigger. You just have to do something like the influx where you got like a 200 micron nozzle. But yeah, it's that's super slow, which isn't 
helpful for a lot of the applications we've thought of for imaging yeah, right. flow, I guess. Don't you think yeah. you're kind of diluting your, your EV in giant amount of sheet as well, which is, I would assume is kind of annoying. No. Yeah, I mean, you could you could centrifuge them, ultra centrifuge, but yeah. Why? <laughs> it's it's more work at the end of the day. Like you need to like you sorted yourselves. You have this this. I I, I think I, I would like a, a a valve of some kind, like mechanical sorting. Yeah, but isn't the upper like limit? Like you're talking about with the flexing like membrane, because there's a limit too on that with what they can do with the frequency. Although I guess if you put a whole bunch in series or parallel, you could probably increase the rate a lot more. Mm. I don't know how feasible that is though. Well, wasn't that uh oh, was it called like the gigasort or something like that? They the basically what? had gigasort. This is I, I don't know. I maybe I'm making this up, but I think they had like like all like huge amount of parallel channels that they could send samples down and then literally have kind of a deflecting um, mechanism yeah. that would send things. And, and so you could sort like, you know, a billion cells per second or something like that. Look at that. You're right. That's insane. The one thing I just remembered on the title specifically, but the valve has this gap below that is let's say one micron so your evs might escape that way but yeah, yeah. there's that it worked through the big stuff maybe we're thinking too small maybe maybe that's where it needs to go they need to have cytometers that can sort whole animals and then we'll put the imaging the fluorescence on that <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, no, no clogs. No clogs, though. I mean, just feed in your fifty rats. And, I mean, they have those imaging platforms, <laughs> right? You can see the whole mouse glow. Like, let's just let's make that the pipeline. Yeah. Full sample prep, full system. All That's right, why so. there's there's all these things out here. It'll be interesting to see how they all they all come together. Like um, Zeiss had the airy scanning a while ago. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's been years that that came out, but it was uh, similar to like a you know spinning disc where if it's moving, you can do a better approximation of you know the actual airy disc itself and where mm. the the focal point is moving. It seems like with that same technology, if you had a wider laser and we're scanning it the whole time and could track movement with detection, you could get super resolution images on something like a flow cytometer as it's moving by. So there's there's all these little pieces of technology out there where it's like eventually I can imagine some big, great giant system that can do it all. I don't know who will get there or how they'll get there in the same way that the SightPix is great because it's just why not put a camera on there? We already got acoustic focusing. The hardest thing is to get these things lined up in the center. I can see that being the BD technology. Well, we don't need cameras anymore. And that was the the big financial hurdle. Now right. that this is cheaper, every cytometer can just theoretically take fluorescent images and then it'll be a nice, you know, afterthought. Um, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why like the BD system can't be, um, really high resolution right because it because you're basically limited by the the laser height um which that you could always fine tune and basically do a slit scan of the cell um yeah no this is this is going back like i don't know probably 20 plus years now but there was a guy pat maybe maybe you know him from Beckman Coulter, his name was Kit Snow. Oh yeah. Okay, so uh, he gave uh, actually it was a chug talk, I believe. It was at Northwestern. Was it at Northwestern? Uh huh. So he was talking about um, essentially a slit scanning um, flow cytometer, and that our electronics are not high enough resolution or fast enough. 
like the actual sampling rate of the electronics, the detector, uh, the electronics downstream of the detectors are not fast enough. And but essentially, if you had it fast enough, you could tell the difference pretty easily between um, membrane staining or organelle staining or nuclear staining because you would see with really high resolution electronics, you would see kind of the the blips of you know, first you have the membrane staining, then you, it goes down again, then you get the nuclear staining goes up again, and then you have the other membrane. So you'd have pulse, um, um, and analyzing the pulses coming from that. If you had enough resolution, you could actually pick out organelles and all this kind of stuff inside the cell as you were scanning across the cell, right? So, which is kind of what the BD platform appears to be doing. They're just they're just marking the, the, um, is it the x-axis or the y? -axis? The x-axis, I guess, with a frequency to to look at position um, of the fluorescence. But you, so so, anyways, all that to say is we could have much higher resolution images coming from these platforms and. You know, then if you have kind of the speed of flow cytometry with images that are actually worthy of being called images, um, perhaps the, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, imaging making flow cytometry obsolete, but maybe flow cytometry making imaging obsolete uh, if we get high enough quality images in a super fast, you know, sort sort um, capable instrument. What do you think about that? Build that site tech. You just lose so much structure as, as soon as you go from adherent to suspension. Sure. So it'd be great for like immunology, but I'm just thinking of like at every award-winning confocal picture and it's, you know, beautiful actin networks that are just completely destroyed as soon as you, you lift them. But I'm sure that there is there is something out there and it's always getting cheaper, right? Certainly. What's that? Right. What is, what is the perfect imaging cytometer that you could, that we could build with all these different technologies? Cause you know, I was thinking about with fluorescent lifetime imaging and if you could take a 48 laser and split the optics and, you know, three different parts on the flow cell, you could get fluorescent lifetime imaging from a cytometer. And that alone would couple gray with SciTech with like spectral deconvolution software to do that kind of deconvolution with uh, fluorescent lifetime imaging would be cool. There's the white light microscopy now too, where you can take the white light and split it into every single nanometer and recombine it. Maybe they're thinking about that for imaging. I don't know. Yeah, didn't uh, didn't Bill Telford try a, a white laser with a bunch of uh, filters on the front end to create like I don't know I think he split it up into like uh, like twenty laser lines or something really? bands or at least to to do like twenty excitation sources. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, but it seems like I I don't know I like I like the acoustic focusing. Right? It seems like a no-brainer for any time you wanted to image something in flow. I mean, I, I the the BD technology sounds pretty cool, although you know we'll see what that actually does. Um, <laughs> certainly, spectral deconvolution needs to be in the mix. I don't know. Does like the um, actual sorting capabilities of something like the uh, Bigfoot, is that alluring to add into the mix? Like, you know, sorting plates super fast and yeah. eight streams of sorting and all that kind of crazy stuff. The other thing is, I mean, we we talked a bit about the title before, but like the 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 quality of the cells at the outset of the sort are is, is kind of critical. If you're gonna sort based on images, uh how how in, presumably you want them to be in the best possible shape at the outset. So I'm I'm kind of confused about why you would put them on a droplet-based sorter. 
if you, I don't know, I feel like it's images are, you're looking for such a fragile phenotype that putting that on the droplet base kind of, it's kind of screwing up the pooch. It's, it's just like not the best. I don't know. It, it doesn't feel like a great idea to me. I could only say the droplet base for something like EVs where you just need that yeah. fluorescence as like a, a marker, but for anything else, no. Yeah, microfluidics should be way better. Right. I will say that for morphology-based sorters, something like the Taito um, and like these applications with our groups, the acoustic focusing is really cool because not only does it line the cells up in the middle, but it aligns them all in the same direction. So like yeast will all be lined up in the exact same direction. And what's interesting with that is that it's made rarer populations appear. Right. Where before they were just in the noise scattered around with their orientation. So there might just be some things too that we're going to start seeing more that we never thought of before, just as some of these newer technologies get implemented. Yeah. Forgot to ask, like on the image stream cell sorter, do we get rid of these speed beads? Do we still need those? Or is that just like... Not if we're acoustic focusing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only point of this. That speed beads are just there for... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's either it's either beads for autofocusing, it's uh, uh, acoustic focusing to not to, to ensure everything's in the same plane, or it's the um, cameraless BD system where you're basically focusing the laser beam um, to some depth. I would assume to capture um, all the cell, but you know. I imagine it's still got to be somewhere in the middle of the core stream. It's probably still susceptible to stuff moving around. Sure. Is there anything else besides acoustic focus and hydrodynamic focusing? Uh, yes. Uh, guava has a super neat. Put it with the guava, man. <laughs> <laughs> Being guava. No bueno. <laughs> I don't know. Even if there aren't that many applications that we can think of for it, you know, anybody's watching this podcast, I'm still happy if you want to give me one and I'll find some uses for it. Yeah. But. <laughs> All right, people, I ran out of questions. Uh, I think we can call it today. Like basically, what do we think about imaging flow? We'll let Northwestern buy their Discover S8 and see how that goes. <laughs> that's, that's a general that good. Right. I honestly don't think it's particularly a bad idea. I just think that like Northwestern it, it needs to be out there for a while and get, oh. get some people who actually have good ideas about how to use it. I mean, that happened with a lot of other things, too. So I, it may be actually much more useful than what we're able to think of at this time. So I wouldn't want to write it off, but I wouldn't buy one if I was still working. Right. Yeah, let's Northwestern do it, and we'll uh, <laughs> what they do. That's gonna be great. Hey, do we? Do we uh, does anybody know what what the price tag on that thing is gonna be? Uh, the Discover. Yeah, I want we were considering writing an equipment grant for it, and I think that I want to say we got a quote for eight hundred thousand, but don't quote me on that. Oh, it's not a million. I thought I thought it would it would hit that price tag. We might have gotten the quote for the cheap H one out there, but right. or maybe it was the beta version of Purdue that we were trying to buy. <laughs> right. So what? We'll ask Dave so, Adams. He has a. He has a. He has yeah, one. I'm sure. Does he have one? He's he purchased one. Yeah. I I just don't understand how he can get every single instrument. He's a nice guy. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <coughs> yeah, we'll okay. have, to have a field trip to Ann Arbor. And yeah. Fire it up with them. All right. This has been fun. Ryan, Pat, Danielle, thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank, hey, thanks for our thanks, listeners. David. And uh, don't forget to uh, do the YouTube stuff. It doesn't matter. The thing is, 
uh, our, 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 the audience has been dropping uh, quite a bit, uh, the audience of the Chalk podcast. Um, and I guess we, just to finish off, like basically uh, people should know that the, the podcast is cursed. Um, the viewers <laughs> of the podcast uh, will die within seven days. Uh, <laughs> different means like it doesn't really matter but like unless uh, unless unless they show it to somebody else uh and then uh, they're okay. okay but that person that watched it then that person dies and so they need it's like it's kind of a it's a problem it's a problem to to maintain our audience uh it has been difficult and that's why uh we took a year off to figure out and then we couldn't figure it out so we just uh, forget it so deck podcast will discuss spectral cytometry while playing Fortnite on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know because Ryan Ryan is still alive. He doesn't watch the podcast. <laughs> yes, I definitely do not watch myself in a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, guys. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, David. See ya.